okay. Everything's gonna be just fine. Hard Space Shipbreaker sees you take on the role of a shipbreaker, someone who cuts apart ships for their salvage. Of course the ships you'll be breaking apart are spaceships, and you're not on Earth, but in the cold vacuum of space. And even though you're a few hundred miles from Earth, you still have to deal with the usual problems of any work environment, like not having enough time to get the job done, management that pretends to care about you, the risk of breaking something expensive that will be coming out of your paycheck, having a reactor meltdown explode and destroy all your work. You know, your typical job hazards. Now for some quick backstory about the setting. Desperate to get off the hellhole known as Earth, your character signs a contract with the Lynx Corporation. And like everyone, you skim over the contract, because I'm sure it won't come up in the future. And after choosing your voice and the chicken option, you're off to a new home, Morgan Station. With the goal of paying off your small 1.2 billion credits worth of debt. Honestly, that's the most annoying one. And with every first day on a new job comes the usual stuff. Orientation, a tour around the facility, having your gene sequence ripped out of you so it can be used to make a spare of you, which kills you in the process, but that's what you signed up for. <laughs> I think. And once that's all done, you get to go to your home, aka the Hab. Yep, looks good. The only thing you'll be doing in the Hab is hanging up posters, listening to messages, and upgrading your gear. You can also look out the window. Moving on to the important bit, let's talk about the salvage yard, where you'll be doing your job. You got the processor, furnace, and the barge. There's also these space hanker things. And if you ever need a break, you can watch the Railjack or look at Earth. Florida is looking good. Seeing as you'll be in space, let's discuss your work environment. As games aren't usually set in the Endless Void, things might be a bit disorienting at first. You'll be working in zero gravity, so your rules aren't typical. And a good first rule to remember is that there's no air in space, so keeping an eye on yours is vital. The only way you'll be replenishing your air is from a kiosk. On occasion, you might find a canister in a ship you're breaking or from an upgrade later on. The next thing to remember is that an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. And normally that outside force would be friction, and on Earth that friction is caused by the air. But as mentioned, there's no air in space. So unless you're good with that grapple, if you're unable to catch an object when it's moving, then it will be someone else's problem, at some point. Now the problem you're going to be dealing with throughout the game is pressurized areas. These are areas within a ship that still have oxygen inside. And like most things in life, pressurized areas have pros and cons. The main pro being that when inside a pressurized area, your oxygen will not decrease. And if you have a certain upgrade, then you will recover oxygen while in a pressurized area. Now on to the downsides. Fire requires oxygen, and a fire will quickly lead to damage. And damaged goods come out of your paycheck. So if an area is exposed to the endless void, then there is no oxygen and fires can't spread. Now depressurizing areas is simple. Well, at first. At the start, you just use atmospheric regulators, which will pressurize or depressurize an area of the ship. Of course, there's always the quick way to depressurize a ship, but this isn't always the best idea. As it may lead to valuable items being destroyed. Now, depressurizing areas will become more challenging as you gain certification ranks, which is your level. Those atmospheric regulators that you've been using start to become rarer. They'll still be there, but most will be broken so you'll have to find a way to make do with what you got. As a tip, I found it easy to use the remaining atmospheric regulators to depressurize one area of the ship, then open up doors inside. Now that you know more about your workstation and the dangers of space, let's take a look at the tools of the trade. There are only four of them. Your scanner, cutter, grapple, and demolition charges. The first tool we'll be talking about is the cross-spectrum scanner, but we will just be calling it the scanner. The scanner allows you to see through ship's bulkheads, and with that ability you can see the structural layout of a ship, identify hazards, and anything that might be of personal interest. The scanner has three modes. The structural mode highlights cut points while also color coding ship parts based on weight. Next, the system highlights ship components like cooling pipes. The last mode, object, just highlights all remaining objects that should be deposited in the barge. The scanner is valuable at the start of a ship break, letting you get a grasp of what you'll be breaking and what potential problems you might have. But after a while, as you get used to the different types of ships and their configurations, you'll probably be using it less and less. Your next main tool is the module laser cutter. Your cutter is used to destroy cut points, aluminum panels, and structural components. The cutter has two modes, stinger and split saw. The stinger is a directed point, allowing you to destroy specific panels while the split saw allows you to cut along a line, and can be rotated 90 degrees. 
While the Stinger can destroy specific points, it usually takes longer because you have to direct all your energy into one spot. The Split Soul, on the other hand, has the ability to cut large areas quickly, and a bad cut will lead to you destroying something you are planning on. Another issue with the Split Soul is when you're trying to cut off a section of a ship. If you miss a spot, then the ship will stay together, meaning you have to look for what you missed, or you just keep cutting until it comes apart. If neither of those work, then it's probably a desk or something holding everything together. Cutting points are easily identified by their yellow color. These points are used to keep the ship's hull together, and cutting them away will expose the inside components. The handheld utility grapple, or grapple as I'll be calling it, will be your second main tool. As you might have guessed from the name, the grapple is used to move things around. With the grapple, you can move things around by dragging the object you've got attached to it, or by reeling it in. When something is grappled, the line will either be blue or red. Blue means that there are no obstructions, while red means that there are, and if you don't get clear of those obstructions, then your line will break. Another function of the grapple is the ability to force push an object. This sends it flying in the direction your grapple is, so you can give things a gentle push to get them moving. And if you get the charge upgrade, then you can give things a big push. Now you need to be aware of the object's weight, because depending on it, you will act on it or it will act on you when you force push. You can tell when an object is too heavy by the indicator on the screen. If it's blue, you're good and the other color, then you'll be testing your brakes. The grapple can also be used to move around the yard quickly. Connect to something and reel yourself in. Just make sure to slow down first. Critical damage. One of the most important tools in hard space are tethers. The tethers are your friends. Tethers work on a simple principle. You attach the tether to the object you want to move and where you want it to move to. Then the object is pulled towards where you want it to go. Of course, tethers have limits. The heavier the object you want to move, the more tethers you will need. Though tethers don't last forever. They have a limited lifespan, but it can be upgraded to last longer. And because tethers are so important, Lynx tries to nickel and dime you. You have a limited supply to start with, which can be increased through upgrades, but the only way you're going to get more tethers is through the kiosk. Tethers allow you to move large pieces that normally you wouldn't be able to. You can daisy chain them together, allowing you to move multiple objects at once. If a tether is blue, then it will pull without problem. If a tether is red, then it will only pull for a short while before fading away. A red tether means that the two points are obstructed in some way. The piece of salvage is higher than the target, for example. If the tether is unable to clear the obstruction, then it will vanish. Tethers are, for the most part, functional. However, there are times when you will run into a bug where the endpoint is placed next to the start. You can tell when it's going to happen, as your tether point will just disappear. But why it happens, I can't say with any surety. But apart from that one bug, tethers work. The last tool you'll gain access to are the demo charges. They are required to blast your way through certain cut points, or just blow apart a ship. They have a limited blast radius, and it's shown to you, so you can use them with a bit more precision than your typical explosive charges. And depending on how that works out, you might need the cutter for a bit of precision work. One thing to mention is that once placed, charges can be disarmed, as long as you have the upgrade for it. Typical links. Now that you have your equipment, you might start to notice that as you use it, it wears down. This wear only affects your cutter, grapple, demo charges, thrusters, and scanners. As your equipment wears down, the efficiency of your gear will lower. A cutter with lower durability will have a lower heat capacity and by extension be able to cut less. To repair your equipment, you'll need repair kits, which are gained as rewards for salvage goals, purchasing them from the kiosk, or finding them in a ship. A repair kit will restore a tool to 100%, so it might be worth saving that repair kit until durability becomes a problem. As you gain higher certification ranks, you'll be able to increase the durability of your equipment through upgrades. You won't ever reach a point where you don't need repair kits, but 80% increase is good. Now that you have tools in hand, let's talk about salvage. Salvage secured. Account credit applied. Salvage can be broken down into three types depending on where it goes. The processor generally deals with the outside of a ship. Panels, thruster caps, cargo hatches, and doors will all go into the processor, along with other stuff like coolant pipes. The furnace will consume the skeleton of the ship, along with things that are a bit surprising. I understand not wanting a mattress, but the table can be reused. All the internal components of the ship will go into the barge. Airlocks, reactors, ladders, lockers, and everything in between. Of course, to reach these, you'll have to crack open the ship, but once it's open, it's open. Unlike the processor and the barge, if you toss something that doesn't belong into the furnace, it will be highlighted red, allowing you to retrieve it and deposit it correctly. 
As you salvage more from ships, you'll reach a salvage goal, which gives you points towards your certification rank, which is your overall level. Salvage goals are dependent on the amount of salvage available on a ship, so bigger ships will net you bigger goals, and greater rewards. But you can fail to reach a salvage goal if you destroy salvage. This could be your basic mistake of tossing a panel into a furnace instead of the processor, smashing a light as you try to pull it out, accidentally blowing up a reactor because something is in the way, you know, the usual stuff. Now that you know about the salvage, let's talk about where you're going to get it from. Ships. Now, there are four classes of ship. The Mackerel, Atlas, Javelin, and Gecko. Most of the ships are realistic and well thought out. I say most of because the Atlas exists. Why is the lever inside the engine section? Now I'm not going to be talking about each class of ship in detail for a reason. They all come in different configurations. As an example, the Javelin has the heavy transport and the refueling configuration. Now here are the ships in general terms. The Mackerel is smaller and will usually have less salvage. The Atlas is slightly bigger but comes in more configurations. The Javelin is large, valuable, and annoying. Then there is the Gecko, which is the largest and comes in the most configurations. You select the ship you want from the salvage menu at the start of your ship. Here it tells you what dangers to expect, how much money you'll make, and the salvage rewards you can get from the ship. If you start working on a ship and it turns out you don't like it that much, then at the start of your next shift, you can simply select another one to work on. The only disadvantage from this is that you don't get access to the remaining salvage rewards, if there are any. Each configuration of a ship comes with its own quirks, which you'll start to master the longer you work around them. It's one of the aspects of hard space that makes you feel like you're a real worker. You're on a time limit, so you start to learn tricks that add up over time. I don't need to cut every point, just enough. I could cut away these pieces of aluminum trying to open up a hole, but aluminum isn't worth that much, so just burn away a panel for quick access. Instead of cutting all the points around an airlock and letting it fly away, I just cut these two and it's not going anywhere. Oh, this tutorial doesn't have a time limit? Well, let me exploit that to do as much work as possible. Now there is one other configuration of ship, the ghost ship. These are ships found abandoned near the edges of the frontier, and by their name you might be able to guess that there's something spooky about them. From the outset, you don't actually get a preview of what these ships look like. Rather, you just get an error. And when you get close to them, your scanner starts acting funny. And then you discover what's going on. These ships are infected by rogue AI modules. These modules have to be destroyed. If a piece of salvage is deposited with the module still attached, then it won't be accepted. So you toss whatever the module is attached to into the furnace or burn it off with your cutter. But once you start destroying modules, then things will start to get spooky. Doors will close behind you, airlocks will cycle without your input, and atmospheric regulators will turn on and off, meaning that you could be trapped indoors or face areas that are suddenly pressurized. Finding the modules is the hard part. They spawn in any number of places, on the hull, random panels, reactors, fuel canisters, which is great. Just great. But like the other ships, at the start, the spooks of the ghost ship are new and exciting, but by your third and fourth one, you've learned their tricks and found ways to deal with them. Keep closing the door on me? Well, now there's no door. This ties into my biggest issue with hard space. It runs out of tricks early on. Your level is determined by your certification rank. The higher your rank, the more valuable the ship. Once you unlock a ship, all its configurations are unlocked as well. Acquiring them is just up to chance. As you rank up, you'll gain access to larger ships, and larger ships are more complicated. Where you just had to pull out a reactor before, now you have to disable coolant, disconnect the engines, then pull out the reactor. Or you remember that you're not getting paid enough and just rip it out and hope for the best. The only difference between the two is that there are just more steps. After certification rank 20, the game doesn't really have anything else. You've unlocked all the upgrades, unlocked all the ships, but after that, there's nothing. It feels like more was planned, but they ran out of time, and instead of just cutting it, they left it in. The only thing you can do after this is improve your time or experiment with new ways of solving the same problem. Which is why I said at the start that Hard Space is a job simulator. With all the gear and ships out of the way, let's take a look at Hard Space's story. Now the story of Hard Space isn't anything special. I was thinking about writing a long section about it, but that's not really what the game is about. Sure, I could go into detail about how your hab is basically a built-in company town like those of the Gilded Age. I could make a comparison to Link's anti-union messaging with real-world equivalents. Remember, the company is your family. The union is your enemy. But it's a simulation at heart. 
Even after the ending, you're still clocking in, salvaging a ship, and clocking out. While the world around you has changed, your world hasn't. What I do want to talk about are the characters. For people that you never see, apart from their little portraits, the game does a good job of making you care for them. Or hate them. See, I'm from people like you. You've got Weaver. You got about five minutes to do it. Weaver out. The old veteran that's made his way into management, knows how things work, and is understanding. Then there's Kato, who's trying his best, but just doesn't seem to get it. You don't shut the processors out. Oh. DD, the other veteran who's still out in the field. Copy that, Mama Bear. Don't call me that. And then Lou, that annoying optimist who tries to see the best in everyone, and brings about a workers' revolution. Then you have that middle manager that's totally your friend, until you make a mistake, then everything is coming out of your paycheck. And then you have the CEO with that crocodile smile, and that whole... We're all family here, while locking you into wage slavery. The characters are elevated by their dialogue and voice actors, who do a good job of bringing them to life and making you care about them. The only problem I have with the dialogue is when it's in your hab. There's no audio issues or anything. The problem is that you really can't do anything. You can look out the window, change your posters, upgrade your equipment, or spin in circles while you wait for it to end. But for the sake of completion, here's a very brief summary. Well, surprising no one, Lynx isn't exactly the best employer. They charge you for everything and are known for taking away your privileges. You have to earn a certain amount per day if you want a chance to pay off your debt. But as the story progresses, Lynx will start adding additional fees, meaning that you'll have to take on more dangerous jobs if you want to keep the debt from piling up. Under all this pressure, it's only a matter of time before something snaps. Eventually, Lynx pushes too far and the workers push back. In the aftermath, conditions improve, some are punished, but the ones in charge stay in charge. The world keeps spinning and ships keep breaking. Eventually, you get out of your debt, fix up a ship, and head out towards the edge of the solar system to find your next adventure or job. Given the state of hard space, you'll probably be doing another job. Even with its issues, I think your enjoyment of hard space will come down to whether or not you enjoy job simulators. The intensity of the game comes down to your own mistakes. If you do everything right, then it's boring shit mess something up, and you have problems to deal with. But if you like the sound of that, there will be links below to where you can purchase the game. So, until next time, thank you for your time, and I hope you have a good day. Really?